Good afternoon, viewers and listeners out there for the British Business Podcast. <laughs> this is going to be incredible. I already know I'm nervous as hell. Welcome, Ian Stafford. Don't be nervous. <laughs> Don't be nervous. In fact, do be nervous because I was in such a rush this morning leaving uh, after a, a, a Zoom that went on longer than, than it should have done. I forgot to put my belt on. So if my trousers fall down halfway through this <laughs> podcast. Just put it down to good old fashioned um, end of the pier comedy humor. Okay. But anyway, don't be nervous because you can only see from up here. So we should be able to get away with it. What goes on below, beneath the table stays beneath the table. Okay. I'm now going very red. All right. Ian. Yes. I don't even know where to begin. Can you take us back somewhere 10, 20, 30 years? Where did it all start for you? Well, my father. You know, got into bed with my mother um, nine months before I was born. I mean, do we need to go that far back? Uh, my, I wanted to be a journalist okay. from the age of about th 13, 14 years old. I was very lucky because I knew what I wanted to do. Okay. Very few people uh, know what they want to do, even when they're 20 or 21, 22, let alone 13, 14. And it's because my mother was a Fleet Street journalist in the 60s when you didn't really get female journalists. So journalism was ingrained in my soul. It was exciting and I really wanted to do it. Um, and I did all the things that you're supposed to do, work experience, edit at the school magazine. I then went to uh, King's College London to read history. This is back in the 80s, by the way, the 1980s. <laughs> um, and one of the reasons why I went there was because it was right next to Fleet Street, where uh, for, for our younger uh, viewers and listeners, uh, that's where that's the, ho the home of, of British journalism. And I used to walk up and down Fleet Street as a student, like a footballer looking at Wembley, uh, like an actor looking at the Palladium. That was my uh, mecca. And I basically forced my way in. I, I, uh, I, I Actually, what a very early life lesson I had. Okay, I was a penniless student in London. And um, in the final year, and I always wanted to be a journalist, and in the final year... They had a thing called, probably still got it, called the University Milk Round, where big businesses came to the better universities and interviewed people like me to, don't laugh, to pick off the cream of, <laughs> of, uh, of the country's sort of students, etc. And I was penniless. And um, they offered me a job for United Biscuits, which is a, a major organisation, KP Nuts, Jaffa Cakes, uh, marketing, uh, no, sorry, uh, uh, what was it now? Sales and marketing executive, fourteen and a half thousand pounds, and a Ford Escort in the eighties. Yeah, yeah, early eighties. And I, in a moment of madness, said yes. So I took the job, driving around the country, uh, including Cornwall. Just Shane, the producer here, went to Cornwall, and uh, it took me two months to realise what the bloody hell am I doing? <laughs> I've just turned away against something that I've always wanted to do. And it took 14 and a half grand and a bloody Ford Escort to do it. And I walked out of the job. And uh, I realized at that point, and I've stuck to this mantra ever since, um, don't go for the reward, the financial reward at the start of the equation. Try, and I know this is easier said than done, but if you can, Try and do something you really want to do, you love doing. If you do that, the chances are you're going to be good at it. And if you're good at it, you'll get the reward. And the reward, of course, define reward. Yes, finance comes into it, but it's not everything because my rewards over the last 35 years has just been the stuff I've done and the adventures and the stories and the scrapes and the things that I've done, you know, and you know what, I, 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 you, you think it, that the thirst would be, would dry up. No, no, it's, it's still there. And, and I just want to do more and more and more. So to answer your question, uh, what I did then was I, I started writing to a, a magazine called Sports Week, which was Robert Maxwell's attempted version of Sports Illustrated, uh, which is the big US yes. sporting Bible. Um, and, uh, it was full of Fleet Street writers, you know, well-established writers. I was a nobody. But I wrote a letter to the editor and heard nothing. I wrote 12 letters to the editor. And the 12th time, I got a letter back, which basically nicely told me to off. So I then picked up the phone and got lucky. But I created my luck. And I got hold of this Welsh guy, 
uh, who's the chief sub-editor at that, the magazine called Roger Sims, I said, hi, right, um, I want you to tell me everything about your editor, this guy, Roger. So he told me quite a few things. And then I said, put me over to him. So he said, all right. So he put me over. And I went, uh, hi, Roger, it's Ian. Who, Ian who? You know, the guy who keeps writing letters to you. Go, and he, go, and he, he could hear him go, uh, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? Look, listen, I have a meeting tomorrow and it's directly opposite your office, which wasn't strictly true, <laughs> shall we say. Um, for the sake of five minutes, why don't I just come in and, and say hello? And I just wore him down. He goes, okay, fine, five minutes. So I went to see him the next day. And an hour and a half later, he gave me a job. Wow. Uh, and it was a gopher job. It was running about doing stuff. But then once I was in the room, it's the old adage, isn't it? It's one thing getting your foot in the door. It's another thing staying in the room. I was putting my hand up for everything, for everything, for everything. And then my sort of big journalism break was that uh, somebody got ill. Of course, my hand got went straight up. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. And they sent me over to Ireland to cover the Tour of Ireland uh, cycle races just after Greg LeMond had won the Tour de France, an American had it gone down well because he basically gate crashed what was supposed to be a French party. And he was there, it was in, and went all over Ireland for the, for the week. And the final day, I was, uh, I, I asked the guys who were driving me, I need to go to the loo. So I hopped out, I said, go on, go on, I'll get, I'll get another car, and went down a little track where there was a cornfield where nobody could see him, you know, did what I did. And uh, suddenly I looked behind me and Greg LeMond, the cyclist, has gone down this track, got off, seen me and said, I'm done. I can't do this. I'm too tired. And I went, well, let me introduce myself, Greg. <laughs> and we sat down in this cornfield and I did this interview with him. And I went back, wrote it. They couldn't believe it. They said, how did you do that? I said, oh, you know, I've told you I was good. Um, and from that point onwards, I became one of their big writers. Then the magazine went bust after six months because it was Robert Maxwell. Uh, I've got some stories about Robert Maxwell, <laughs> but that's for another day. And um, I was kind of slightly, and I mean really slightly known. And then went round the Fleet Street pubs, because in those days it was all about the Fleet Street pubs. I mean, the level, I was a professional drinker for the first 10 years of my life. Um, and I was basically haranguing all the sports editors, you know, I could do this, I could do this, I could do this. And anyway, started picking up work. Um, I became very quickly known as the most prolific. Uh, most hardworking journalist in, in sports writing. Um, and I remember one day I had my byline in three different newspapers on the same day with three different stories. Um, and uh, uh, eventually uh, I was working for The Times. Somebody came back to me. The same guy who was at Sports Week magazine who I harangued then went to, to the mail on Sunday and uh, he said, look, I, I'd like you to work for us. Would you come over as a freelancer? I said, no way. You either give me a job or I don't do it. I mean, looking back, the ball's on me to do that. I said, right, okay, well, all right, here's a job. And then I got a job. And uh, and then that same year, I went to Poland with uh, uh, some English football supporters. I mean, they were hooligans, basically. It was at the time when it was all going off in the late 80s. Pretty nasty. And I, I went on this trip to Poland under an FA trip, so it was supposed to be nice. And they're all, they're all National Front... Uh, British National Party people. Just to add, by the way, 98% of England football fans, even then, were nice. Yeah. <laughs> Just talking about a minority, but a sure. vocal minority. Sure. And I went with them to Poland, and um, they discovered that Auschwitz was uh, uh, 15, 20 minutes away from Katowice, where, where the, the game against Poland was. And they all went to, to Auschwitz, and I went with them, being very careful not to be seen to be um, uh, inviting them to do stuff. I didn't need to. They were there uh, doing Nazi chants, uh, 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 Nazi salutes, etc. I took some photos. You know, ashen-faced middle-aged people walking around seeing these uh, sadly English hooligans. Uh, hooligans. I went back, wrote it. Uh, it was read out in the House of Commons. Uh, I received six months of death threats, and I became the youngest ever sports journalist of the year. Uh, not anymore, but back then I was, 1989. And from that point, it, it, it really took off. And uh, I mean, by the way, we're early up to 1990 now. So, I mean, you know, I've got another 30 got an years hour. to tell you. Right? <laughs> We've got but, an hour. but that's how the journalism thing began. Uh, and uh, I, I also remember that, for, that, that within months of me joining the main on Sunday, I was at the Seoul Olympics. Um, I was at the European Football Championships. And basically up until about 2014, 
uh, as well as all the, the book writing and all the TV and all the radio, etc. I've been incredibly lucky and I've traveled the world and I've covered all the great sporting events, picked up a few awards along the way and uh, interviewed I'd say probably 80% of the world's biggest sports stars uh, since sort of 1986 onwards. And it has been a gas. And I have done all these other things as well. You know, 23 books, uh, participatory books, playing alongside these great sports stars um, and lots of TV and lots of radio. And uh, I, I launched a an online sports magazine. People... It was almost before my time to do that. And everybody th thinks I've been very, very clever in being so multimedia <laughs> and being so foresighted to do that. And the truth is, no, I, I haven't worked any of this out. I've stumbled and lurched <laughs> from one thing to another. And the only reason why I've done all these things is that I have the attention span of a gnat <laughs> and I get bored very quickly. So I quite like doing lots of things. It keeps me uh, young and energetic and passionate and, and interested. And, uh, and I remember in 1992, I, I was a chief sports uh, reporter of the Mainland Sunday. I, I, I just won this massive award. I was on TV on Saturday morning, something called Going Live, being interviewed. Because uh, America saw me as Britain's best sports journalist, which I wasn't, obviously, <laughs> but because I won that award. You know, I mean, I didn't. I didn't necessarily argue with them. And I was <laughs> beginning to get lots of work everywhere. And I walked out uh, of, and I just had a baby as well. I, I, I walked out the job. This is the second lesson in life I had, okay? I walked out the job because I, I was in my late 20s and I didn't want to stagnate. And I saw people 10, 12 years older than me stagnating, doing the same thing. And I didn't want to be that. And I didn't want to see somebody like me coming up fast on the on the ropes. So I walked out because, you know, everybody wanted wanted a piece of me. Everybody wanted me to work for them. And I went home and I just waited for the man to knock on the door with a silver platter with all the opportunities in life. And guess what? <laughs> didn't that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> and after about a month, I was sort of a, sort of like Bazzi Faultier. Faulty, sort of like, oh, I can't swear, but you know, you can imagine. What have I done? What have with I done? With a baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a new, new bomb, house. Yeah, all that new, stuff. Yeah, yeah. All the yeah. trappings. Yeah, all the trappings. And um, I thought, what have I done? So I had to like a crisis down. Look, I thought, okay, right. Maybe life isn't as simple as this. So you've got to do old-fashioned grafting. Roll your sleeves up and get on with it. So I had a, I had a probably like, an, oh my God, what have I done moment once, once a day. Then it became once a week. And then it became once a month. And at the end of that first year, I ended up matching what I'd earned before, but working three times as hard. But then the second year, I doubled what I was earning, and the third year it went on and on and on. Now, that was that wasn't it wasn't really about. Obviously, I had responsibilities, I had to earn money, but the opportunities of that came that came about. Not least all the participatory writing, all the books, all the adventures uh, that came about because I realised, okay. Life isn't as simple as that after all. You can't rest on your laurels. Um, you can't assume anything. You've still got to graft. And uh, that was the second big lesson in, in life. You know, just for a moment, I got caught up in the, oh, you're, you're the youngest ever sports show into the year. Everybody wants Believe to speak your own to you. Hype. You're on TV. Uh, mm -mm. You still have to work very hard. And that was good. I'm glad it happened. Yeah, it happened in my late 20s because, uh, and I've, I've grafted ever since. I still, sometimes I don't quite know what to do with myself if I'm not working. But I'm lucky because I love my work. And what's that Confucius quote? If you enjoy your job, you never do a day's work in your life. I've never done a day's work in my life. Wow. I pause for breath. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly, the quote when you were talking about proverbial kick up the backside is you giving yourself a kick up the backside, yeah. which is very different because most people don't do that. They don't have that foresight or mindset to do that kick up the backside. I'm very hard on myself. Yeah. I beat myself up quite yeah. a lot. There's you a know, lot of bravado, yeah. but there's a lot of great messages that you're sending out of people out there that are going, actually, this guy, although he's got a great sense of humor and he's done a lot, you're a self-starter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, you, you, you can't get away from it. You, you, I don't know anybody who's, who's succeeded, and when I say succeeded, 
I'm talking about sort of growing a great business. I mean, because, you know, success is, yeah. define wealth, define success. Yeah, success could be just be contentment in life, yeah. you know. So that, but in terms of this conversation, I don't know anybody who hasn't created a fantastic business without having to work hard. And I still work, work hard, very hard to this day, but I'm lucky because I enjoy, enjoy it. it. So it's not work? Not really. It doesn't feel like it. I mean, like, like later on tonight, um, I'm hosting at the Sporting Club, which I'm sure we're going to get onto, <laughs> uh, a big Burns Night dinner. Uh, but it doubles up as a Six Nations preview. Um, and uh, we've got Kenny Logan and Matt Dawson in the room. And uh, I can't wait. It's going to be 240 people. It's going to be a lot of fun. Do you know, actually, that's quite an interesting story. Uh, about 10 years ago, I decided I wanted to start. Uh, I prided myself as an interviewer. I, I won quite a few awards as an interviewer. Um, and I decided I wanted to, to start hosting events on stage and do live events and things. And it's funny because in the beginning it was, you know, sort of rugger bugger dinners and, you know, I couldn't control a crown and everybody's just getting drunk and everything. And then it's morphed into, I still do all that stuff, but it's morphed much more into me doing big interviews with big stars on stage. So, and I did a massive Usain Bolt dinner a few, few weeks ago and, and I do this all the time. But the point of the story is this, 10 years ago, I didn't have to do that. I was you know, successful as a writer, as a broadcaster, as an author. Um, and I fancied the challenge. I remember the first sort of year, year and a half, uh, sometimes it'd go well, sometimes it'd be all right. And sometimes you knew it hadn't gone well. And my mindset was driving up to wherever it was, whatever happens in four hours time, I'll be back in my car going back again. And sometimes I'd be driving back and, I, and I, I didn't know how to control a crowd. I wasn't confident enough to know how to control a crowd. And um, I'd be saying, why are you doing this? What on earth? You don't enjoy it. You don't like it. You don't need to do this. So this is self-doubt. Why? Well, from somebody that doesn't yeah, seem like he's got any doubt. A, a, a little bit, a little bit. But there's other voice. You know, okay. By the way, by the way, I don't want to make it. I've got loads of voices in my head. <laughs> <laughs> um... Uh, as I told myself and you the other, <laughs> the other day, but this other voice in my head said, well, what are you going to do about it? Because you're not going to walk away because you don't do that. Yeah. And even though I didn't really like it, I'm I had no choice. So like anything, I use the analogy of when you're learning to, to, uh, to drive a car and you got, you're trying to, you know, the clutch and the biting point and you, ah, you keep storing the car, you keep storing the car or the uphill starts the same. You keep storing oh the God. car Ah, oh, and then one day you don't, and you never look back. No. And so I don't even remember when it happened. It may not have been a, a particular thing, but I went from, oh, not looking forward to this, to, I mean, like the Usain Bolt dinner I did at the Grosvenor House, 1,200 people. Now, the thought of doing that wow. a few years ago, I would have had sleepless nights, despite everything else I may have done, sleepless nights. Now I wake up and I'm punching the air bring it on because I'm confident and I'm better. I'm good at it now, but I've, it's taken time and practice, practice and practice. And I think it's a nice for someone like me. And by the way, people listening to this, <laughs> please don't be like me. You don't have to be like me. There's lots of other ways to be happy. <laughs> it's just me. It's not easy being me for anybody, for me or anybody else around me. But I, I, um, you know, I was punching the out. I loved it and I'm confident. But it's taken time. It's practice, practice, practice. You can only get better. Only get better by by practicing. And you can never think you've you've cracked it, or you know you you don't need to learn. You the never more, stop learning in life. The more I practice, the luckier I get. Gary Player, beautiful. Gary Kerr holds it from the bunker. Oh, are you lucky? Yeah, he said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Funny, funny. You should say that. Yeah, because guess what? The more I practice, the luckier I get. I love a quote. Brilliant. How much is money? And success. You said something about earlier about success and the def definition of success. I, I'm constantly striving in my life to constantly try to work out: is it the money? Is it the big house? Is it the is it the car? Is it actually me getting up and punching the air like you do often? I I have it, but I don't have it enough. I'm striving for it. How do you get that? I think it's everybody's own definition. It's okay. not for me to preach to other people sure. what success is. 
you know, and I, you know, if you're if you're say you're 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 a librarian, a lot of people I think, oh, that's not a very interesting life. But if you, it's it's the best that you love books. It, you're not stressed. Uh, you're happy. Fantastic. Beautiful. Well done. You've cracked it. Seriously, that that's how I look at it. Okay. I don't judge people on. I remember telling you a story. I was at this god awful dinner party, and and people, you know, I don't actually sub. Contrary to what you might be thinking now, like to talk about myself and what I've done all the time. You know, it's nice to listen to other people sure. and, and to switch off. But invariably, when all the accountants and the bankers found out what you did or you were interviewing, you know, Dan Carter last week or, 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 or Freddie Flintoff or whoever it might be, they all want to know. Sure. So, of course, they're all asking me questions during the, the dinner. And this is guy opposite me, and he was a classic. And again, no offense, people, I'm I'm not trying not to characterize, but he was a classic sort of a uh, boy done good city broker who who wanted to make it very clear to everybody that he was wealthy. Okay. Okay. And somebody mentioned this book, uh, uh, Playgrounds of the Gods, which is the first of four participatory books I wrote. The premise behind those were I was a pretty good all round sportsman at school level. So I played first team sport at various about four or five different sports. I played county sport under 18. But as, a, as I discovered, there's a massive gulf between that and being a professional sports person. So I went around the world and, and wrote books where I played sports with all these uh, famous sports teams or sports, individual sports stars, and then wrote about the experiences, okay? Um, which was sometimes humorous, sometimes quite... Uh, oh, okay. So, quite, so how... So- you this this is a that... tangent, by the way, from okay. the story I'm trying okay. to tell you. Sure. Um, and so I, I wrote all these books. They're fantastic experiences. And you threw in sort of uh, political and socioeconomic, you know, if you're playing football in Brazil, poverty-stricken Brazil, but you've got a beach and you've got the sun, that's free, and that's where they play. I ran with the Kenyans in the 3,000-metre steeplechase national trials at 3,000 metres altitude. And, uh, oh, I've got another story for you. Um, and, um, you know, uh, again, so I've done all these things. I'll tell you this story about the running in a second. Um, but this guy leant back in his chair and he went, how much did you earn then for that, for that book, Playgrounds of the Gods? How much did you earn for that, mate? <clears throat> and I went, how much did I earn? He goes, yeah, yeah, that money, money. How much money did he make? Money, 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 money. And I looked at him and I said, millions, millions and millions and millions. In fact, my friend, those experiences right in that book, priceless. And then I said, have you heard of Oscar Wilde? Yeah, yeah, I know Oscar Wilde, yeah. One of my favourite Oscar Wilde quotes, my friend. The problem with you is that you know the price of everything and the value of nothing. Wow. Now, obviously, that didn't go down particularly <laughs> well and it did a party. But my point was... You know, when you talk Wonderful. about success. And I'll tell you another story, Kat. When I was running the 3,000-meter uh, steeplechase, and it was in, uh, in Eldoret, in the high, in the Rift Valley. And it was wonderful. It was one of my... This is what about memories and stories. Yes, yes. And there were 15,000 uh, spectators at this ramshackle stadium. There were cows and sheep grazing in the middle. <laughs> and there were 15,000 of 14,998... Uh, Kenyans, uh, black human beings, there were two white human beings, me and an Irish priest called Father, Father, Father Connor, it might be Father Connor. And he was an athletics coach. He coached a lot of them. So he was very, very well known. He had a mule. I mean, it's also out of a film and just me. And we, we did the race. And I was obviously, I don't rock up, I train. Uh, but it was, it was 9,000 feet, 3,000 meters. And I was with the best. These are the national trials. So we, we set off and I kept up with them for 200 meters. But the difference was, whilst they were jogging languidly, I was sprinting. Fall out. Sprinting. And I thought, if you carry on like this, you are going to explode in about a lap and a half. So I... And how many laps I, were we talking well, about? 3,000 meters, meters. Eight and a half. Yeah. Quick bit of maths very, there, eight very, and a half. <laughs> so I went back to my pace, and with two laps to go, it was just me. Everybody else had finished, two laps to go. And I had a whole order go, go Mazungu, which is Swahili for, for white guy. Go Mazungu, go Mazungu. I fell into the water jump, <laughs> and they're all laughing, and, and then I finished. And Kip Kano, the great Kip 
Kano, the godfather wow. of African middle distance and long distance running, two-time Olympic gold medalist, 68 and 72, came up to me and he said, I want you to come to my house tomorrow. And he said where it was. And wow. Now, again, for people who don't know who Kip Kano is, Kip Kano is, was the Usain Bolt yeah. of world athletics and certainly African athletics. You know, all the famous Africans have gone on to do what they've done. They they need to thank Kip Kano. Long distance running. 68 and 72 Olympics. So the next morning I went to his place. He actually runs an orphanage. Uh, and I went there and he took me inside and he said, right. And he gave me, he said, this is for you. And it was a very cheap sort of African water gourd. It's sort of like, a, it's sort of overly shaped. And we're, no, no, probably the uh, best way to to describe it is um, aubergine shaped. Okay. Um, and it was pretty cheap and it had a little bit of multicolor beading on it. And you could probably buy it in a market for two pounds or something. And he said, this is for you. And I said, why have you given me this? And he said, because you entertained me. You made me laugh. He said, but he said, more importantly, you finished. You finished the race. And I want to give you this. I'm actually getting quite emotional thinking wow. about it. And, uh, and I've got it now in my house. And if my house burnt down tomorrow, I would run in and get it. Now that is worth yeah. nothing. Yeah. And it's worth everything. So that's what I'm talking about. Success, price, Remember. wealth, experience. That is, you can buy it for two quid in the market. It's worth everything. Wow. I've got loads of stories like that, <laughs> by the way. Can we talk about a little bit about the sporting club mm. because you've got this event tonight what is the sporting club what does it mean the sporting club came about because i had a eureka moment in the bar i probably wasn't in the bath actually that's where eureka had his moment i don't know where my moment was and basically i used to meet lots of people all the time in either coffee houses or hotel foyers or in some of the private members clubs in london i was a, a honorary member of quite a few and you know, with respect, uh, when you start a sentence with respect, you know, <laughs> you, well, I, know. I, I wasn't wild about them because they're either really old school, you know. I mean, I'm okay because I'm middle-aged and, <laughs> and a bloke and white. So, you know, I tick all the boxes. Um, or they were too cool for school. Oh. And I just, you know, I'm a, a people person, as you may have gathered. And I, I, I don't judge people by their wealth, whatever that means. Yeah. Or that I, I judge them if they're proper people. Proper people who understand... Sure. You know that good business is a win-win, not a win-lose, and 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 people who will do things for you without necessarily wanting a return. Just uh, you know what a proper person is. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so all this business, you know, walking into some of those creaky old farty clubs with the you know the floorboards creaking and the rustle of the telegraph <laughs> wasn't for me. Neither was I mean. There's a particular club, a uh, very well-known club. If you wear a suit, they don't let you in because you're not cool enough. I don't care what you what you wear. Well, apart from Shane's shirt over there, which is a bit dodgy, um, I, I I don't care how you look. I care about how you are. And obviously, sport it sport is the world's greatest common denominator. Okay, I've got the story. It's in a, it's I've made this up, but it probably happened somewhere. Okay, <laughs> where Jimmy, who's nineteen, just finishes um, his uh, his uh, stint at McDonald's and goes next door to the pub because he's a massive. Anthony Joshua, boxing fan, and it's on that night, Saturday night, in the pub. And he's on £12 an hour, whatever, and he sits at a bar stool because it's on the TV and buys a bottle of Budweiser. Charles, the 55-year-old uh, owner of his own company, is driving in his extremely nice car, but he's a massive boxing fan. And he sees on a big screen in this pub that it's on. So he pulls over, walks into the pub, and the only available seat is this stool next to Jimmy. I've made the story up, sure. but it happens somewhere. Sure. And he orders a <clears throat> Hendrix and Fever Tree. Uh, <laughs> and they're both watching uh, the Joshua fight. Joshua knocks the guy out and they're both hugging each other. What yeah. else would bring Charles and Jimmy together to do that? Nothing. Maybe music to a degree, Maybe. but not as much as sport. sport. So sport is the world's greatest common denominator. And I felt there was this massive niche to bring mm. people together uh, under the banner of sport but it's, it's really a business club. And so I, I, I went to a, a place in, in Mayfair, which is now defunct. A lot of the clubs and members clubs got it wrong. They all smoked their job done cigar in 2000, 
and didn't realize that over the preceding 20 years, you know, diversity has become a much bigger issue and a long way to go. Speaking as a ginger haired person, <laughs> uh, long way to go, but it's getting there. You've you know, got some. And, and life is, you know, and we now live in a world where you get 26 year old CEOs of tech companies yes. and they certainly don't want to be in an old club, etc. So they stood still. I said to them, look, I want to launch my own club. I want to live here. You're going to let me because I'm going to create lots of business for you. I got lots, all, all, the, all of my members will, will, will be spending money here. And I began it by doing events because the one thing I could do is dip into my very, very deep black book. And I started producing loads of great stars. Uh, and the first one was Eddie Jones, funnily enough, who'd just become the England coach. This is 2017. The second one was Sir Steve Redgrave. And if you want to know why I use sports stars, when I interview sports stars, well, first of all, I don't like to use the word interview. I like to use the word or well, the phrase a fireside chat. Okay. Because that's what it is. Like we're having now. Absolutely. Um, and so Steve Redgrave, okay, uh, my second lunch, and a member said to me, I'm not into rowing. And I said, right, okay, let me just, <laughs> let me just explain something to you. <laughs> this guy won five Olympic gold medals in 20 years, okay, uh, one of the most grueling sports imaginable. He was 40 when he won his last one, and he earned next to nothing for doing it. And the guy said, yeah, yeah I know that's really good, but it's still a bit, still rowing. And I said, no, I'm not finished. And for the last 15 years of those 20 years, he had colitis, Crohn's disease, and type A diabetes, three of the most debilitating conditions you could possibly have. So what does that tell you? Wow. I will tell you what it tells you. <laughs> Number one, he's a serial winner. Yeah. Number two, he's built up a no excuses environment because no CEO wants to know why you haven't done it. Yeah. Not interested. No. And number three, whatever's thrown at him, he found a way. So my friend, are you telling me this is about rowing? Because I'm telling you, this is about life. Yeah. And all the top sports stars I've ever known, yes, it's a given they have a skill set. They can hit a ball with a bat or with a racket or with their foot. They're very good at that. But there's many people very good at that. It is all, all about this and their mindset. And these are the same qualities that we all need we all need when we fail when we're on the floor do we stay down there or do we get up like and, and that's why that's so the guy went oh i see he came along to the to red grave lunch with three clients came up to me after and said that's the most inspirational day i've ever had in my life and i went <laughs> i rest my case so i used the sports stars and then it grew the club grew more members you know we're not an events company we're a club we have members from across the whole business community because Everybody's in the sport. If it's a niche, it's the world's biggest niche by a mile. <laughs> and then we, we, we moved into a second club in London, then a third club, then I moved to Manchester. And all, everything was ticking on very, very nicely. And it's basically members have use of all these venues uh, to hang out in, to work, to, to meet friends, to meet colleagues, to meet fellow members. Um, uh, and then we also have all these events, which again, are great fun anyway, but also great client entertainment opportunities and also fantastic uh, business development opportunities. You know, we, I'm a massive believer in, in order to build great business, you first build great relationships. So that's kind of old school, but it's, that will never change. No. I know what I really love about our events is because I host them. <clears throat> and um, not because it's an ego thing, it's, it's the only thing I'm actually half good at is, <laughs> is, is, is hosting. And I'm cheap. Um, uh, I love it at the end where it finishes officially and then the afters go on. And I, I uh, so for example, a lunch finishes at four o'clock and there's 120 people in the room. We try and, try and make it reasonably intimate. At six o'clock, there's still 70 people there. At eight o'clock, there's still 40 people there. And at 10 o'clock, it's a somewhat bedraggled uh, 20 people there. And you know what? None of them knew each other before they joined the club. And nice. I look back and they're shaking hands, they're laughing, they're back slapping, they're buying drinks, they're saying, oh, can I introduce you to somebody? And you did that. And what happens then is that somebody might say, oh, I do this. Uh, and then you say, right, great. Do you know what? Let's have a coffee next week and we can talk about it. Right. What are you having? Gin and tonic or something? And there's no sort of people going around handing out business cards like confetti. It's not one of those speed networking businessy things, which you know, I think are God awful because they're not real. Sure. And, and you get to know people. We have our, my business mantra is for the club and for me actually: good people, good business, good fun. And I think all those three things are very, very important. 
Then COVID happened. You know, not great. Not great for a guy who um, was running a business that had venues that were closed and events that were that didn't happen. Not great. And by the way, it's the first business I've ever run. I've only really been a grown-up for about four and a half years. Okay, before grown that. Grown-up meaning you had your own business. No, no, as in a grown-up. <laughs> <laughs> as, in, as in an adult. As in an adult. Um, and then we had uh, COVID. And, you know, I, I look... I think perspective is a massive thing in in life. It's it's if you use perspective, you're going to be okay. So you know, COVID was was tough. We lost a lot of members. We we were really on a roll, and then somebody burst our balloon. Well, COVID burst our balloon. Um, and uh, but I just decided, well, you know, don't be fake about it, but be positive and and still use the time to make things happen. It gave me a chance just to slow down and to have a look at what was working, what wasn't working, where I was spending money well, where I wasn't spending money well, which is quite a lot, um, <laughs> and was able to tighten it up, get a better structure, um, and make it and make it work a, a lot better. Plus the fact it could have been worse. You know, who, who, who am I to complain? With the life that I've had and the fun I've had, I've got no grounds to complain about anything. You know, my cousin, God bless her, uh, was diagnosed with motor neuron on the day that lockdown was placed. She couldn't even go out. It took her 15 months to pass away. So honestly, you know, if you, if you put it right down to that level, we've got no no right to complain about about anything. Um, and then obviously, you know, with with even last year with with the COVID hangover, uh, the war in Ukraine. Again, not complaining. Could be worse. We, you know, we could be in Dnipro now or, or, sure. or Kiev, whatever. So yes. it's all relative, but obviously yeah. not good for the business. Sure. The cost of living crisis, the energy crisis, the Liz Trust <laughs> asterisk show of a government and that mini budget, and then the and then the strikes at the end, all, all of which are challenging. But it is what it is. Sure. You've just got to get get on with it. Um, and so right now we're we're just beginning to get on, get on a roll again. Uh, we, we're known for our events. And last year we did um, Dan Carter lunch, a Colin Montgomery lunch, uh, Damon Hill lunch, a Sir Jeff Hurst lunch, uh, John Daly lunch, not for the faint-hearted, that one. We did six Sugar Ray Leonard dinners all over the country, which was great. For, I mean, again, I'm on stage. I'm, I've got the best seat in the house. Yeah, you know, amazing. it's not a job, is it? No. Um, uh, interviewing Ray, who I know quite well, superstar. You know, we've got uh, so many fun things lined up this year. We have our great uh, end of year awards dinner. We have every year. We had Boney M featuring <laughs> in December, doing all their hits, and Lord Sebco and Johnny Bairstow and Dame Lord uh, Kelly. We had Klitschko, uh, Vladimir Klitschko on stage from the bunker in in wow. Kiev, all appearing at our awards dinner. So we have a lot of fun. Uh, but around it, all our members use all our clubs. We're now, you know, five in London. Birmingham, Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds, Durham, 10 and, venues, six and, cities. And just so our listeners and viewers out there, to understand, yeah. you've partnered with hotels and business venues that they can go and or, work or, in or, 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 or meet or, in. Or, or members clubs as well. It, it's a bit of everything. Uh, we're at Birmingham, we're at Edgebaston Stadium, which is the cricket ground, but we've got our own business Brilliant. lounge there, over on the cricket. Um, in uh, Manchester, Liverpool and Leeds. We're in these amazing uh, members' lounges, which only us and the, the company's VIP clients can use. They're beautiful. Durham, it's like Edge Bass and it's overlooking the cricket ground. Yeah. London, uh, we're at uh, M in the city and Canary Wharf and Victoria, Lescargo. Yeah. In, so, and they've all got members' lounges here. And so we, we live in all of them. Fantastic. Okay. And so we, you get all these venues, you get all these events. And then we pride ourselves on good old-fashioned business matchmaking. Brilliant. We put people together and we ask for nothing back and except how, love and loyalty. And how would a prospective client get hold of the information? So they go on Sporting Club. It's all on the Club. website. Okay. All on the website, the, the sportingclub.co. .co people, not .co UK, not com, just .co, sportingclub.co. All the info's on there. On the homepage, you've got all the member benefits. There's all sorts of discounts as well, by the way. I mean, to the point where if you embrace it, you actually end up saving more than you spend, by which I mean you, you'll be doing things that you do anyway, um, taking clients to events, enjoying events, using restaurants, using hotels, you know, using our, our, our rooms for board meetings, which normally cost you a small fortune, but you yes. get as part of the package. So you do genuinely end up saving more 
more than you spend. It's all there on the on the website. But the beauty about this is people I get people smarter business people than me. If I my business brain matched my creativity, I I I'd be um Warren Buffett. Sadly, I'm a British Rail Buffett. Um, uh, but uh, people say, what's your exit plan? What's your exit plan? Obviously, your exit plan is what, sell for X amount of mil in five years' time. And I say, no, I'm not trying to build a house here. I'm trying to build a home. And I will be, what else am I going to do with myself? Sure. I mean, when I go to the beach, and I'm a redhead, it takes me 15 minutes to slap on, <laughs> you know, to make sure that every nanomillimeter of me is covered by some factor 854 <laughs> sun cream and that takes 15 minutes and then I've done it and I sit there for two minutes and then I start twigging my thumbs and well I'm bored now what am I going to do now so what would I do with myself so I will be carried out on my shield still doing this hopefully in a number of years a number of years time but yeah I mean listen we're, we're having we're having a lot of fun we'll have a lot of fun tonight um, and uh, it, it, it brings all my skill set together interviewing uh, uh, bringing people together, having a lot of fun. Uh, I'm still going, uh, which, you know, from where I come from, you know, it, it's a cool world. And a lot of my contemporaries in the world of the media, they've kind of, you know, it's such a fast-moving entity now in the media that, uh, and pretty ruthless as well. It spits people out. So I'm still here. I'm afraid people. I'm not going anywhere. And I'm loving it. We've gone massively over. Surely not. Surely not. You know why, don't you? You you talk too much, okay? <laughs> right? Little is tip, there, don't talk so much next time. Is there anything else that you want to mention you, that you think, well, actually, I could put that in and that's going to be good for the, the club or, or, or anything? I mean, Well, well uh, two things, okay? okay. If, if you've got 40 minutes. Um, <laughs> two things. The first thing is... First is just just the club. I mean, this is really really important. Okay, okay. Uh, we 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 have so many business success stories. By which I mean, thanks to the club and thanks to direct putting people together, uh, our members have made quite a lot of money, and we ask for nothing back uh, because I think that would change the dynamic of the club if we started favouring people. Okay. Um, so you know, being around a bit, you know, I like to try and surround myself with good people. My my, my back is full <laughs> full of holes. Okay, <laughs> but it hasn't deterred me from the belief that. You, you help people out. And if you help people out expecting something back, you're going to be very disappointed in life. You, either, you, you do it because why not? Yeah. It costs nothing to try and be nice and, and, and to be helpful. So we're having a great time. We're a different concept in that instead of just, if you want to just to stay in a very, very nice club and say, oh, God, I'm a member of you know, whatever. I won't name them, but we all know who they are. I'm a member of that. Great, fantastic. Knock yourself out. Uh, but, um, you know, if you want to, uh, increase your network, uh, make friends, have uh, attend loads of loads of great events, and build your business. Uh, especially post COVID, when we sort of slightly changed the office mentality. You know, we're video conferencing a lot yeah. more than we used yeah. to be. Yeah. People are working from home more, which is all well and good. But you don't want to be video conferencing as as I do in my shirt and tie and jackets and pants, and that's it. Uh, <laughs> nobody knows that. That's a secret. Um, uh, you know, you need to go in and see people. You still got to engage with people, people. Okay. It's not enough just to do an email, whatever. And, oh yeah. We've engaged, get to know people. And the only way you can do that is to sit down face to face, have a coffee, have a beer, have a lunch. You still got to do that. So that would be my message from, from the sporting club. Come and join us. Um, uh, cause we have a lot of fun and we're a community. And then in terms of, in terms of life stories, I mean, we've barely, st- <laughs> I mean, barely scraped the surface of, of, you know, me running with the balls in Pamplona, uh, me doing the crest to run 12 times. I mean, I've, I've, I've signed so many waivers over the years that basically say, um, you may die doing this, please sign here. So it's not our fault, <laughs> you know? So, uh, so I, I've done that. But all I would say is, um, uh, we have probably one shot, one opportunity. I've gone all M and M now, one <laughs> shot, one opportunity, embrace it. Don't have regrets. Don't die wondering. And failure is not failing when you try something. Failure is not trying to do it in the first place. Brilliant. Wow. I've never been as nervous in my life to do a podcast. Today was just incredible. Ian, thank you so much for coming in, for your time, for your stories. There's hundreds, thousands more I know. We could fill a hundred podcasts up, but... Until next time.